You ready? No. Me either. The wheel of time turns, and ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend. Legend fades to myth, and even myth is long forgotten when the age that gave it birth comes again. Welcome to the Weaves of the World podcast, a Wheel of Time community journey through the events of the Third Age. What was, what will be, and what is may yet fall under the shadow. Hello, you beautiful beak-faced Twilight lovers, and welcome to Weaves of the Wheels podcast. I'm Sue Anna Sedai, I Sedai of the White Tower. And I'm Ren Tyen, Asherman of the Black Tower. So we just did our first reenactment of the Wheel of Time, Perrin and Egwene. 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 We're learning pronunciations. Yeah. And Egwene's okay, you go. part. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of proud of myself. <laughs> I remembered. Yeah, I'm kind of proud of you too. That, that was a big I'm, moment. I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, Suana, before we get into the meat of this episode, I was thinking we should just touch on what on Prime releasing those concept arts. Mm. So, Friday was the 15th of January, and it's been 31 years since Eye of the World was released. And in honour of that, what on Prime released um, concept art just for us fans. Yeah. Now, did you want to just talk about a little about what concept art is and how what you thought about it? Yeah, sure. I mean, concept art is, for those who don't know, it's really just a first stage before you start making sets and costumes and things like that. So it's used in TV, in film, in video games. You kind of draw out these sort of rough sketches and you use them to basically portray your thoughts to paper to screen. Yeah, to see if your head canon matches what other people's head canon is and whether it will work in the show or not. Yeah. So, I mean, this isn't something we generally get to see. Um, what did you think? Did you like them? Was it what you were expecting or was it completely different <laughs> through your head canon? No, I mean, do you know, it was nice. It's cool. It's not something we generally get to see and yeah. I didn't I, I liked them. I didn't get blown away by them. When I've seen uh, like the Game of Thrones concept arts, for example, I've gone, whoa, and like my eyes have melted in my face. And <laughs> <laughs> like that scene in Indiana Jones, and just the face melting when the Holy Grail opened. <laughs> uh, but like, I, Helena sent me um, some Game of Thrones concept art and I was just like, that's like, that's so badass. And I wanted to see that. In where does she, where does she send that? I didn't... She sent that to me personally, we're friends. Oh, yeah. okay, we're okay. Speed yeah, thanks Helena. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, um, so she she sent me that and I thought, oh yeah, you know, that was awesome. And, and I didn't get that same reaction to the What on Prime one. However, however, and this is this is something that, you know, we do need to stretch. Uh, Rafe Judkins, he did say that these are early concept arts. So, yeah. Yeah, he, did know, say that. he did say that. So therefore, I mean, I, I know I've seen a kind of a little bit of a mixed bag of feelings towards them. I think it's very important to remember that they are early stages, and I, I do believe Ray Jokins has sort of said since that only one, one of these actually has really matched what they've done on screen. So they've obviously yeah. made quite a few changes to these ones. Yeah, I think this was more those, let's get a couple of ideas, let's see what works, what we like, what we don't like, mm. and we can work from there. And this is one of those, it's almost like a documentary, like behind the scenes of this is the kind of stuff that you would expect to get on the bonus DVD. That's right. That's yeah, why. Like, yeah, yeah, like you buy the set and and you get this kind of stuff on the and, yeah. and we're getting it for free. That's awesome. So thank you very much, What on Prime, for that. That's cool. Yeah, thank you, buddies. Yeah. So I mean, let's talk about what we're looking at here. So we had a few pictures and we had, like I said, we had a, we had a really mixed bag in the community. Different people. Some people were really like loving them, and some people were a little bit. Meh. There, there was definitely some pictures I I thought people were more responsive to than others. So let's yeah. take a, a little look at them yeah so we had random Matt looking over a quarry possibly the old quarry close to the mountains of mist yes um so catherine said i she speculated that maybe this is our introductory scene to meeting rand and matt because she sort of noticed that it very much looked like rand and matt but rand didn't have a sword so that suggests it's before he's been given the sword on winter's uh -huh, night yeah. and there is this rumored scene that the introduction to the girls is going to be this sort of like women's circle initiation and that possibly this could be the contrast to it with meeting the guys and they're sort of looking 
for adventure and excitement and uh, Jedi, <laughs> Jedi craze, craze not not these these things. Things <laughs> Jinx, buy me a Coke. <laughs> um, but also, uh, Amber at the Road to Tarvalon, she uh, sort of compared uh, these, this picture with, do you remember, uh, probably like a year ago now, maybe even longer, we got that sort of behind-the-scenes shot of Yosha Shradowski as Rand, and he's sort of standing on a mountain, and there's like mountains in the background. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's having sort of his hair fixed by one of the yeah, cast members. Yeah. Yes. And she sort of compared that to the picture of the quarry um, and, and the mountains and saying, you know, are these potentially similar? Is this sort of the same scene that we could be okay. looking at? Helena Sadai says that, that that shot that we got of Rand was definitely in Slovenia. So I'm not sure if the timing adds up. I'm not quite the expert on <laughs> where everybody <laughs> is and when, but it is possible that that could be potentially that scene that we're looking at. So what was the next picture then? There was two pictures actually, wasn't there? There was the, the Beltine in Emmons Field and there was one of the Wine Spring as well. It looks like... I think it's the same... It looks like the same thing, just from a different angle. Yeah. Like, one of them, potentially, we're looking at the back of someone. So we're looking from sort of behind them as they're looking out onto the village. Yes. And the other one is more of a sort of a widescreen shot. Yeah, I the think village. the first one, um, the one that you just spoke about first, it seems like there's a cart there, and then it's somebody looking over the cart. Mm. So I don't know if we're getting padding Fane's first, like, Maybe. glimpse, or, you know, yeah. that, that says, like, oh, look at all all these light shame products are going to come and take this. <laughs> yeah, I think this one is probably the one that Rafe refers to as being the one that probably most closely represents. I would think so. I think because we've seen that uh, wine spring in shot before. If you remember, we got that little sort of teaser trailer in September. Yeah. I, I think that's probably the one that most likely is the one that's going to represent what's on screen. It just looks the same. Oh, and next we had the, the Tinker Wagons. That's right. Um, I was a bit disappointed with this one, and I wasn't the only one. Mm. Um, I didn't feel they were colourful enough. Yes. I think a lot of people pointed that out. Mm. An artist that's um, in one of the reading rooms at Weaves of the Wheel, Corey Lansdale, uh, he was surprised by the subdued colour palette for the Tinker's Wagons, and it had him questioning if it was the Tinker's at all. Could it be anything else besides Tinkers? I don't think so. I don't think so. I no. think um, it has to be the Tinkers. I think, I think it's unlikely that it's going to be... It has to be the Tinkers, so we want more colour. More colour for the Tinkers. More colour. Yeah. Um, the next one, we've got sort of the villagers. It looks like the villagers on horseback. I mean, we can see girls, we can see guys. We can definitely see like a warrior scout in a head, which looks very much yeah. like Lan. And they're sort of just walking along uh, a road and they're sort of crossing this very small bridge. And there looks like there's maybe a tower in the background between the trees, very faintly. Right, okay, I didn't it, notice it, that. It was one of those, if you looked at it, you'd miss it. But if you really looked at it, oh, you'd you see it. Oh, you got pinch and zoom. Yeah, <laughs> pinch and zoom. So... What do you think the tower is? Could it be the Tower of Genji's? Or Renji? <laughs> <laughs> Bloody hell no again. Um, <laughs> well, was that like the first sort of glimpse into Shadow Lagoff? I, I think that could be very possible given uh, one of the other pictures we get, which we, we'll get onto in a moment. Uh, Camilla said I did point out uh, that there's a, a sort of a white pillar stone in this shot. And she questioned, could it potentially be a portal stone? Yeah, on like the other side of the bridge, isn't it? Yeah. A portal stone. You know, it very well might be. There, because, you know, a lot of shows, they start to put these things in just so that you start getting accustomed to them, so you're used to them. Mm. So when they're all of a sudden like, hey, here's a portal stone, you'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember seeing that. I remember that. seeing that before, yeah, it's, yeah. So it's not something like, oh, mm. this is brand new. Where the hell did this come yeah, from? Yeah, it's like they were always there. Yeah. And, yeah, I get I get what you mean. Ah, the last one, though, this is my favourite, I think. This, this was my favourite one, too and I think it was a resounding favourite and that was the one which we all very much assume is Shadar Logoth yeah I agree I agree yeah. I think it was, uh, what gives it away to me that it's probably Shadar Logoth is the little touch of the fog yes yeah. Yeah. I feel like with this one, they nailed it. And as much as I said, I'm sure the Beltine one is going to be the one that we see most on screen, I really hope it's the Shadow Lagoth one because <laughs> this was the only one that made my jaw drop. Like I saw it and I went, okay, I like that one. And it was right at the end as well. And yeah. I was like, yep, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm, yep, I'm here for this one. That's pretty cool. Deej, he said, Deej said, if that's Shadow Logoth, then he, he, it couldn't be more perfect. And they oh, he really liked it, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, and it, they absolutely nailed it. He said that... He's a tough man to please as he's well. He's a very tough guy <laughs> to please. He's, he's hypercritical of everything. Uh, yeah. But he says that that has sort of given him a bit of faith in the TV show. Like I said, he's quite a critical guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually 
given him some faith in the show that he feels that it kind of looks quite dark and gritty and, and that's one of the concerns he had. Okay, so that's what we got. What's your general thought on this? My general thought was for something that they didn't have to put out, I liked it. So overall, yeah, I'm happy. I'd like to talk sort of about the main reaction that we saw. I mean, we've got <laughs> we've got like sort of several fan chats and we've got different people, different types of opinions. We've got people who are oh. so hyped for the show and people who are so nervous for the show and people who really just don't want to see a show and we get so many different types. Yeah, for me, I mean, overall, the thing I heard the most was, when's the release date? Well, when's, when's the trailer? Yeah, that's it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's everyone wants something a bit more now. Like, I feel like we're getting to that stage where people want to see a trollop. Or yeah. they want to see um, a costume. I really want to see how they're going to incorporate the use of the one power. I think that's a big one for a yeah. lot of people. But I honestly, I think if the first time we see that, we'll be in the trailer. Yeah. I don't think we'll see anything of that before You don't the think trailer. before, no. no. It will be, you'll see a whole trailer and then right at the end we'll just get a little touch of the, the one power. Just a little weave or a, just a little word or two that goes... <gasps> And that's like, boom. Probably more rain just weaving fire and throwing it at the Trollocs and that will be the climax and then the wheel of time, words will appear across the screen and that will be the end of the trailer. That's, that's the first time I think we'll see it. Uh have you made one of these? I'm, I really want to watch this. Well, um, we, you know, Weaves of the Will has been around for four years now. Uh, we have a lot of people who make different concept art, so we, kind of, we see this stuff all the yeah, all the time, true. don't we? Um, people making stuff. So yeah. Uh, that's how I imagine it will go. I'm not an expert, but uh, I could be if What on Prime wants to hire me. So let's carry on with the show then, yeah? Let's do this. Okay, so this week we decided to listen to the audiobooks. For the first time. For the very first time. Read by Michael Kramer. And Kate Reading. Correct. Not Blanchett. Not Blanchett. Um, so we decided to give the audiobooks a try and we agreed that we would listen to Dragon Map. I can honestly say I have listened to it. I did too. I know, it's crazy, right? <laughs> yeah, I, do you know, I actually really enjoyed it. Did you? I found myself like I had too much time to do other stuff. I was just on my phone, like playing games and on Instagram, <laughs> seeing what you guys are up to. <laughs> so, yeah. That's, I mean, that's not a terrible thing, but I, I was quite, um, I was able to do something else while having it on in the background. And um, Dragon Mount was read by Michael Kramer. It was awesome. Oh yes, his voice. Um, he did this bit when Ishmael, I want to say. Ishmael. Yeah, he turns up and um, Michael Kramer changes his voices and he sounded like Gargamel from the Smurfs, you know, that it was brilliant. <laughs> I laughed a lot. <laughs> I thought it was really great. I thought it was really good. Like, it kind of matched what I was reading uh, Ishmael in my head as. Really? You had him as Gargamel as on the Smurfs? <laughs> I guess I did. Okay. Papa Smurf in it. Lewis Ferrer must have been Papa Smurf. <laughs> I guess I did. I guess that's how I... But it was so... Um, it was just like I, I really enjoyed the uh, changes in the dialogue. And I really enjoyed the way Ishamel... He sounded just very cool and... Yeah, like the way they had his voice was how you sort of imagine somebody that's like doesn't walk in the light <laughs> don't you think but also it's a little bit indifferent to the whole concept as well which Ishamel is and, and I thought it was um, I thought it was done really really well yeah. I really enjoyed it I was I was far more engaged into listening to the audio than I expected myself to be I know classically when I've listened to audiobooks I've been just drifting off and I don't know if it's because I only set myself this, I'm just going to listen to this one <laughs> chapter. Right. You know, it wasn't that long. Yeah. It was like 10 minutes or so. For me, um, I actually was really excited because, you know, I've never listened to the audiobooks before and um, I was actually like really like, oh God, this can be jokes. And then for the first sort of like few minutes, I was like, yes, mm. yes. And then I was like, right, okay, what's going on on Instagram? <laughs> <laughs> what are you guys up to? <laughs> So that's how it went for me. But no, um, being honest... Short I, I, attention span, yeah. Very short attention span. <laughs> um, maybe it matches my height. <laughs> <laughs> this, um, for, for listeners who you know, maybe haven't read the books before or are reading them for the first time, this, yeah. let's give a quick summary of, of what this Dragon Mount prologue okay. was about. Non-spoiler or spoiler? Let's, let's start with a, a non-spoiler overview. Okay. So there's a guy who's walking around his house 
calling for his wife, and the description is that there's bodies everywhere. Oh yeah, and like there's bodies that have been like absorbed into the stone as well, and yeah. contorted faces uh, that have just been yeah, calcified. Was, you know, I never noticed that bit before while I've been reading it. But I did、um, actually notice it in the audio. So there you're you so、uh, distracted by this guy roaming around.、Yeah. He's walking around the house. The house, you know, we're getting a couple of clues that. This is a nice house. It's very nice. That's very. It's a very regal yeah, house. It's got marble. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I liked the fact that he pointed out that you know there's lots of beautiful tapestries and masterpieces among the walls, which have remained undamaged. As they should.、So、unlike it's history. Yes, unlike his children. He, he he looked to protect the artwork. Yeah, he's oh no, not the artwork. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is worth money. Um, there's people absorbed in stone and. Faces of terror, and this guy, you know, is just like unbothered by it, like completely unbothered by it, and he's just looking for his hot wife, Ileana. <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna lie. Every time Michael said Ileana, I echoed. <laughs> I was like Ileana. <laughs> so he's looking for his wife, whose name happens to be Ileana. Oh, was it? I didn't yeah, catch that. It was Ileana. <laughs> And he can't find her,、Dude. and then and then he walks over to the mirror, and he's like looking in the mirror, laughing. Like, <laughs> Good show, buddy. <laughs> I like what you've done with the place, buddy. This guy is basically you. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then his best mate turns up,、yes. and he's like, I love what you've done with the place. <laughs> yeah. Did you redecorate? This is nice. This is alright, you know. I'm not sure about like the dead servants just laying on the floor everywhere, but yeah. I like, I, like I like what you've done. It? Yeah, it's, it's very feng shui. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like it's bringing in the ambience. I can really feel the ambience. Are we going with death and murder? <laughs> Because if we are, it's great. And he's described as being all in black. Yes, very, However, very、um, the crow. Yes. Yes. Okay, so this guy then turns up and he starts saying, "Lewis, you're." The Tamerlane, you're the servant of this. You've ordered nine rods. You know you've bested me here, and now look at you, Wagwan. Yeah, it's all.、Um, you know, if you're the first time reader, and this guy comes in and he's like, you know, you're this, you're that. Nine rods. Are I mean, for the first time, this you're going, okay. I have no idea、yeah. what any of this means. Yeah, you、Is、know, it significant. I don't think it was significant in hindsight, but looking at it, you know, when you first read it or listen to it, you are sort of like, oh, okay, what's these nine rods of dominion?、Mm. Like, I thought it was going to be something along the lines of some powerful artifacts. So it's no spoiler to say、uh, what the nine rods of dominion are. So the、mm. nine rods of dominion are actually the governors of the age. Yeah. So Louis Farren was the first among them, or coin in the old term, which translate to first and can then summon these governors as and when needed. Yeah. So I think a lot of people in the third age thought that they actually were objects of power because there was never anything really written down about them. But yeah, they were just governors. It was confusing. Is、um, what's happening here? Who's this dude walking around screaming for his wife? Who's this other guy that's turned up? Are they buddies? I mean, why are there they... dead body parts everywhere? And yeah, and why are we just sort of like looking for Ileana? Yes, because it quite clearly states that there are children there as well. So、yeah. we're not concerned about the children. We're, we're not just... worried about the dead children. No, we're just concerned about the wife. The hot wife. The hot wife. The hot blonde wife. Well, Ishamel is the man, is the gentleman in black who who has appeared, and、uh, Ishamel says, you know, you are the hand who slew Ileana Sunhair. Oh, Sunhair. Is that how he refers to her as Sunhair? Yes,、yeah, Sunhair. I missed that. She's blonde. She's blonde. <laughs>、okay. We just want to be clear. She's she's, she's a hot blonde. She's a hot blonde. Yes. Okay. This guy, this this loose Theron guy. Who apparently was also referred to as the dragon at some point in time, has been walking around his house、yeah. blissfully unaware of the haphazardness of body parts and 
wreckage and fire. And Ishamel is like, hang on a second, why are you so blissfully unaware? I'm, I'm, I don't like this. Yeah, I you... need you to be aware of what's of happening what around you. Yeah. yeah. So he says, I'm going to heal you. We don't know what that means at this stage. Yeah, is, that, is he going to drop him two paracetamols? What, what's he going to do? A <laughs> <laughs> you know? couple of antibiotics. <laughs> exactly. Take this me for in two a week. week. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We don't know what's going on. We, we have no idea. He says, you know, I'm going to heal you, but it's it's not kind what I'm going to do. Uh, he's referring that, you know, this might be it's, a painful yeah, process. Like being healed by the Dark Ones, a lot more different to yeah. being healed by the One Power or something, wasn't it? Yes, this is this is what he's stating. We, we have no idea what this means at this point. Yeah. But apparently he does something, he summons something, there's some form of magic, and Luz Theron is healed, and he can see yeah. the horror in front of him. Yeah. And I think, his sorry... Friend, Prior to that, though, there is a recollection from Lewis Fern, right? Because Ishmael says, Shaitan says the S word. And Lewis is like, oh, you shouldn't say that. You can't say that here. Yeah, You're you not allowed you to say Voldemort. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there is that little recollection, like, you know, he's not completely gone. There's some basic recollection there. Yeah, but then it all sort of comes back when he heals Lewis Ferrin. Yes, when he, he heals, he suddenly he's aware of these horrors that lay before him and he's also aware of who this man is now. Yeah. And he's very quick to blame this man for what's happened to this guy's house. Ishamel then says, whoa, uh, no, that's not what happened you did this. <laughs> Bro, I just got here. I, I, was just... out, I was outside. I was waiting to be let in, man. You're not going to blame me for this. Yeah, this one wasn't me. I've done a lot of fucked up shit, but this wasn't one of them. I draw the line here. <laughs> <laughs> but he's, he's he's clearly enjoying himself. Oh, yeah, you oh, can tell. Yeah, he's in, he's enjoying this downfall that's happened. There's, there's a mocking tone, which Michael Kramer captured. Uh, very well, oh, yeah. Was, I have, I have yeah. to say, that yeah, was, was very good. It was brilliant. And he says, um, I did not slay Ileana sun hair no no <laughs> not mine it was not my hand it was yours yeah. and there's that satisfaction he's very very pleased so what we've learned here is that these two guys are enemies they don't like each other they've obviously had a long-standing beef yeah um is is, is beef a term outside of the uk i don't even i don't know but i understood and you... i nodded <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah when we say beef it's you know it's like they, they've got Issues. animosity yeah animosity they, yeah. animosity they don't like each other they don't like it yeah there's, there's a like long-standing it. history they don't like each other they've got a lot of problems and then this guy is like this guy Luz Theron is like oh shit i can't live with myself yeah, my wife is dead, and there's some other people as well. But my wife is dead, and, and that, that's what was important. Yeah, my wife is dead. Yes, and you know, um, there's some kids there too. But oh no, 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 my wife. wife, my wife, my wife, my wife. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, brilliant. <laughs> So, Louis Ferrin is aware he's killed his family at this point, and Ishmael is feeling smug and is like, They won't call you Dragon anymore, Kinslayer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is this is the part in the story where you become very aware that you're not at the start of a story. This isn't no. this isn't the beginning of a story. Yeah, this is definitely something's happened. Yeah, this is you know the middle to the end part, and we've sort of been dropped in, and we're expected to know what's going on. We have no idea what's going on. It's almost like you know you come late to a party and something's already happened. Like somebody's got too drunk and they've already done something crazy, and you've walked in and you're like, oh, we're just catching up on it. We yeah. don't know exactly what's going on, but we know there's a victory and this guy Luz Theron who was apparently this champion of the light he is now going to kill himself and what we get is this description of some sort of magic being used there's lightning from the sky yeah so he I'm gonna use the word travels mm -hmm. so he travels from one does place say he travels, yeah. to another place mm -hmm. so he then starts to take in all this magic mm -hmm. more magic than he's ever taken in before yes and there's lightning from the sky and a, the earth is rumbling yeah it describes it as a bright light that comes down from the heavens like a beam yeah like a beam or something like something sort of apocalyptic and that just blows him up blows up the ground around him and makes lava come up and rise into what we now know as Dragon Mount. Dragon Mount, hence the name of 
the prologue. The prologue. And then we get a couple of lines from the prophecies. We get a, a prophecy and the the prophecy is... Oh, you fuck now. <laughs> <laughs> the prophecy is pretty much a, a summary of saying, you know, the earth is torn apart, the entire landscape of the world shifts, and people are killed. There's some sort of apocalyptic event. Yes. Which completely reshapes humanity. Yeah. And that there are also um, hints that, you know, this wheel of time, it turns, and what has been will be again. Yes. We will get to a place where this man who is called the dragon, not a dragon. He, let's be clear on that. He's called the dragon. He's, he's not, not a, dragon. a dragon. He then is going to be born again. Yep. Time without end. Time without end. And he is going to be the saviour once more in humanity's time of great need. But in doing so, he will again destroy the world. So yeah. the world re will rebuild and then the world will fuck up again. As it does. As so, is tradition. You know. So that is that is the non-spoiler summary of Dragon yeah, Man. A you, brief overview. If you're a first-time reader... You don't really know what's happening, do you? Are you it, confused? Like, yeah. are you just deeply... Because, I mean... For me personally, I read New Spring first. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I know. We laugh, we laugh about it. It's it's funny. But I did that first. But So I understood Dragon Mount. When I first read Dragon Mount, I had comprehension. Because you're familiar with the magic. I'm familiar with the fact of... I'm familiar with the magics. I'm familiar with the prophecy. I heard guitarist foretelling. So these are things that I, I was aware of. If you're someone who hadn't read New Spring first, are you just looking at this like, what the fuck? Yeah, so when I started reading these, New Spring hadn't even been written. I um, read Dragon Man, and I suppose a lot of people wrote, you know, read that as well first. That's that's my concern. You don't have any history. You don't know what's happened. Yeah. You know nothing. It's very confusing. Is this in some ways off-putting? to people to continue no, reading? No, it wasn't off-putting for me. It, it wasn't um, confusing and it definitely didn't put me off. Okay, well, I have a question for you then. Sure. Do you think the TV show will start with the scenes at Dragon Mount or do you think they will bypass that entirely at this stage and start in the two rivers? I don't think either of those. I think the story is going to start with Loghain blowing shit up. Oh, I'm here for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm being serious. I think the story will start with Loghain and you'll get a you know flashback as to, yo... What just happened? Who's this guy? What's that he is maybe the actual dragon. Yeah, and then I think what's going to happen is as Moraine and Lan come into the picture, you'll get little flashbacks here and there as to you know, like for example, Moraine might say to Lan, "Oh, we might find the dragon reborn here," and Lan will say something like. Rrr, rrr, rrr. <laughs> 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 I was trying to sound really rough and gruff. And and then what you do, you get a little flashback as to this is what they mean by this. I don't think it's going to be full-on prologue Dragon Mount. I don't think it'll be like that. Or even full-on Empty Road. Yeah, I don't think it'll be like that at all. Okay, that's that's interesting. And and actually, I, I think that would be... It would be very different and, to and start you know, with the The game. thing you've got to understand is um, the people making the show, they're not really worried about us fans. Their concern is the new viewers that they can bring and the people that have not heard of World of Time. And I think this is what they're going to be going for. So they're going to try to make it as exciting as possible. And you know where, I think even Rafe even said it recently, right? It's they're going to try to keep to the source material, but they're not going to keep to the source material. Yes, but you're right. They want to cater to a new audience because yeah. at the end of the day, we're fans. We're going to watch it regardless. Even if it's absolute crap. Even if it's terrible, we're still going to sit through it because yeah. we're hard hardcore fans we're going to be impossible to please um no doubt so first of all you have to go into this accepting that you're not going to please every single fan of the book yeah so therefore you have to think okay do i focus on pleasing this current audience or do i focus on pleasing a general audience well, and, and of course that's the one you go for the general audience is the bigger audience yes yeah. and you've got to have a certain amount of viewership a certain amount of people that have viewed each episode for it to be renewed yeah. So that, that's how I think it's going to happen. Okay. I think they're going to be sort of catering. Because you've got to understand, they've got to make it so that people that haven't read the books can still pick up what's going on. Yes. It has to be easily understood, easy to follow. And I don't think Dragon Mount is the place to start if you want it easily understood and easy to follow. Yeah, I think Dragon Mount might actually even come in in the second or third episode, you know, where they you know a little bit more about Rand, mm. you know, a little bit more about the Two Rivers lot and... 
you know, destiny. There was something recently when what on Prime shared Tom's guitar, and I know every fan listening will, will know of that moment. Rafe also did a, a Q and A on Instagram. Yes, yeah. And one of the things he said that he wasn't introducing any characters that only had a brief scene or two. Yeah. He wasn't going to do that and then wait until they were ready to be introduced fully, because it wasn't affordable. It wasn't worth doing. It doesn't bring any connection to the character on screen. That applies to Luce Theron. Luce Theron is not a character that we see again for a period of time. So therefore, will he actually be just for that one yeah. scene? Okay, so we're in agreement about that. Uh, at this point, I think we need to get into some spoilers. Oh, I love your spoilers. Oh. At this stage, we're going to move into discussing spoilers in the books. At this point, I'm going to tell our listeners just what sort of spoilers they can expect and whether it's safe for them to continue. For this episode, the spoiler level is rather mild. Mostly what is discussed is actually histories of the Wheel of Time, not things that actually necessarily come up in the later books. Listeners are advised that if they haven't finished The Eye of the World, to probably not continue at this stage. We will be discussing who is the Dragon Reborn. We will be discussing the histories of Luce Theron and his role in the Age of Legends. There will also be one very small reference to one of the later books. However, as long as you know who the Dragon Reborn is, that will not actually be ruined for you. There's a lot of really great stuff that we can talk about that we know from this prologue. When you first read it, okay, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but we no, now the, the, have the hindsight, the foresight. Yeah, it leaves a lot foresight. of questions, doesn't it? It does. It's so, like, you know, why are we here? And um, I think it was really clever, this part by Robert Jordan. He could have gone backwards from the story, like, why has this guy Lewis Throne just blown himself up and created a mountain? Yeah, we're somewhere in the middle of a story yeah, at this point. Yeah, and part, you know, you, you could go two ways. You could be like, what is the aftermath of this? Or you could be like, what led to this? So you've mm. got like two possible things. And I think if Robert Jordan was alive, he probably may have touched on the Age of Legends, like, you know, a different series. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we never know. We'll never know. We'll never know. So let's let's talk about how did we get here? Yeah. What happened? How did we get to this place where this guy has killed his entire family. Yeah. And now he has, we assume, killed himself. He's yeah. buried himself. He's turned into a mountain. He's buried himself in a mountain. He's basically destroyed his very being in this moment of pure power and anger and sadness and grief Regret. and, yeah, all of it. I think what happened was many years ago, people were looking for an alternative power source. We've got the male power and we've got the female power. Yes. The males can't channel Sadar and the female cannot channel... A Sadar channel cannot channel Sadin and a Sadin channeler yeah, cannot no, channel... I understand. There's no gender neutral bathrooms in the Wheel of Time. <laughs> These people find this source and they're like, hey, if we dig here where X marks the spot you know, we're going to find some tr buried treasure. Well, they weren't really digging. It was more of a, a scientific... It was more like Hadron Collider, you know, bouncing particles of each other and making a wormhole type thing. So digging. <laughs> digging through the fabric of time and space. Yeah, we're going to stick with digging. Boldly As... going where no man has come before. <laughs> or woman. Or woman. Yeah. So they start digging. Okay. So, okay, they start boring a hole. You're going to start... Okay, you're going to... Th let's say boring. I, okay. I like that. Okay, you're boring me. <laughs> You're boring me. So they start boring this hole to find this new source of power. And they're like, bingo, we did it. We found a new source of power. And this power isn't... Um, it, gender bias. It, no, it's gender neutral. Yeah. Finally, those bathrooms are opening up to us. Yeah. Yeah, we're all going to have we're a great time. We're progressing. Yeah, we're progressive. And, you know, at this point of time, um, you've got to imagine that Ranland is in like a utopia. Oh, that's, that's how I imagine it anyway. It is. It is it's a very scientifically advanced place um, and it's a place where there is no war. There's really very limited disease. What disease there is can be healed quite quickly. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very, very nice. Yeah, so it's a happy place. Yeah. Things are going well. Mm -hmm. You know, you're in a happy environment and suddenly you make this hole, sorry, this bore, you bore a hole to the Dark One's prison. And you could probably Well they don't know it's the Dark One's prison, but they bore a hole into the fabric of time and space and bam. Bam. <laughs> there's the Dark One. There's the Dark One's It's a bad time now. So they've unleashed um this 
this evil upon the land and the utopia is no more there's this war there's famine there's sickness there's yeah. you find that a lot of um the sort of younger generation of acidize and you know just people in general are like leaning towards the dark one they're like okay this guy's talking some sense i like what i'm hearing i'm gonna get my own podcast show Let's mm-hmm. do this. Yeah. Let's do this. Let's talk about it. And, you know, there's that like, little battles, little fights going on, but nothing too major until... Until some very, very powerful Aes Sedai join forces with this Dark One um, and they want power. Yeah. And in the case of the guy who we meet in the prologue, uh, Elan Morin Tendronai, <laughs> he is... Well, he's a very logical man. You know, if Arjars existed in this time, he would have belonged to the White Ajar. And he very much believed that it's inevitable. You know, yeah. time is on a loop. It's repeating. This has happened before. This will happen again. And, you know, the light side has to win every single time. And the dark side only has to win once. And yeah. it's going to happen. Yeah. That's how Elan's thinking at this point. He's like, yeah. You know, we can lose all the battles, but if we win the one big war, it's inevitable. It's going to happen eventually. And, you know, um, mathematically, it does make sense. Okay, your white Arja is about to come out now, isn't it? If the Dark One only needs to win once, and then the world will be broken and, you know, be remade in the Dark One's vision. Mm Probability-wise, it will happen. If it's going to keep looping until it happens, then it has to happen. Yeah, it's like lottery numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six are very unlikely to come up in that sequence, but it doesn't mean it can't come up in that sequence. Yeah, probability. Yeah. Yeah. So so he's thinking along those lines. He's like, well, they only need to win once, and then I live forever. Mm-hmm. That's not a bad deal, yeah. you know? But then you've got this War of Shadow. It's it's getting a little bit out of hand. The champions of the light, if you will. You know, we know at this stage that there's a light side and a dark side. The dark side being bad and the light side being good. Yeah, but who are the champions of the light? From my understanding, right, you have Lewis Ferry. Lewis Ferry. And that's it. And then you have... 13 Forsaken. He was the leader of the Hall of Servants, so you must assume that the entire Hall of Servants was a light. Or was it just 100 companions? There was definitely, if there was 13 Forsaken and 114 Champions of the Light at this stage, there's obviously more. Okay, I'll give you like one point if you can name another of the 100 Companions other than Lewis Ferry. Well, Steve, obviously. (laughs) <laughs> what drove Lewis Ferrin crazy? Like, why did he think it was a great idea to kill all the people in his house? Lewis Ferrin went crazy because he decided to lead uh, an expedition to this place in the world where the pattern was at the thinnest, the boar was most detectable, and what they would do is they would use the one power to seal up the boar, seal away the dark one, and therefore hopefully you know completely decapitate the shadow in one swoop yeah what he wanted to do was he wanted the most powerful males and the most powerful females to combine the power together and use that to direct at these sort of seven points where the pattern was at its weakest and therefore if they placed it right they could seal away the dark one is is that what it was where the pattern where yeah. the pattern was weakest on yes. the seven points. Yes. Right, so it's almost like a tent, right? You're just sort of pitching it out yeah. to keep it in place. Okay, I understand that. Yeah. So tell me this. Why did the females not turn up to the party? The females didn't turn up to the why party. Why did it turn out to be another sausage fest? <laughs> <laughs> it turned out to be a sausage fest because there was another champion of the light, if you will, uh, who was female, called uh, Latra Decum. Jose, I'm probably I can honestly say I've never heard of this. Person. No, you've probably never heard of her. But if you go on to Google and you type in the strike at Shaogul, you can find um, a really great sort of short story uh, styled in, in the way of a manuscript that tells you sort of the secret histories of what happened. And okay. this Latra Aes Sedai woman, she was like, no, your plan is stupid. It's dangerous. Um, these seven points have to be targeted with such precision that if even one of them is off by the tiniest, tiniest amount. You'll rip the entire pattern open yeah, and the no dark No plan is flawless. No, Come on. No, no plan is flawless. But she thought she had a better plan. And that plan was to create these massive uh, cyan growls, um, which... The Shodian girls. Yes. Yeah. 
and I don't know if we're pronouncing that right. Oh, we will find Ch- out. Chodian cows. We will find out as we go through the audiobooks. She created these things. She or- well, she ordered them to be created. And what it was is that they were creating a male one and a female one. Yep. And they would be able to draw in an insane amount of power, an amount of power that no one has ever done before. And they would create this big barrier. But wouldn't that just tear, like, rip the earth apart? Well, that was what Luz Theron argued. He said, well, you know, on one hand, my idea has its flaws, but your idea has its flaws as well. And because of that, it kind of split the Aes Sedai into two camps. And because it is the will of time and it is very much about the fact that the genders are at war, the genders split. The females, you know, they gravitated towards Latra and the males, they gravitated towards Luz Theron. So is that how they make it out in the Strike Shargo that pretty much all, like 99.9% of the women went with Latra and 99.9% of the men went with Louis? Yes. Basically, any female who was considered powerful enough to actually partake in this expedition was on the side of Latra. So really? even, not even looking at the common sense of it. Not even looking at the common sense of it. Um, which is an interesting thing because you know there's always a lot of debate like is Luz Theron's wife a channeler? Whose side was she yeah, on? Yeah. Because we know that she didn't go, so therefore that, she either wasn't yeah. strong enough to go or she wasn't a channeler, right? Or just stuck with her sorority sisters. Yeah, she does <sighs> The way they referred to her as just sun hair, and I know Lanfear makes a couple of comments about her being a bit, like, dim-witted. It <laughs> does seem to me that Luz Theron was maybe intimidated by Lanfear's intelligent and settled for someone who was maybe a little bit simpler. Oh, that's so that's the perspective oh, I right, was so taking. you're away. saying that he went for eye candy rather than somebody. But then, somebody that could challenge him. Intellectually. Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, because she was... Um, Super because- smart. And super strong in the power. And super so, stunning. Yeah, so they say it's Lanfear, Beauty and brains. Brand. Wits and tits. <laughs> <laughs> so they're saying there's Lanfear, there's um, Lewis Ferrin, there's Ravin, and then there's Elan, who are the most powerful channelers, right? Mm-hmm. They're the strongest ones. They're at that plus one in the companion guard. Yeah. Okay, so you reckon, so seriously, you reckon at this point in time, Louis Ferron is like, I don't want to hook up with Lanfear, right? I want to hook up with Ileana. Mm-hmm. And you think that's all to do with the fact that she's smart, Lanfear's smart. Mm-hmm. I think that's Louis Ferron's personality type to a T. Wow. Yes. Wow. I stand by it. I cannot believe that you are talking this way about the saviour. I will talk however I want about the so called. You do realise he, like, risked. His own life. You do realise why the women were just nattering away. (laughs) You do realise that there were constant references to him inside Rand's head whistling every time a pretty girl went by. Because that's his personality type. The clues are there throughout the series. The dude is crazy. He doesn't know what's going on. He could be whistling at anything. But it's specifically pretty women. It's never ugly women. It's never women who are considered unattractive. Okay, but wh- he's obviously not that crazy. Like he knows what oh, he's doing. Excuse me. When he when they say pretty women, they're looking at the whole thing. They're not looking externally at like the facial features. No, they're and looking the at the ankles and the good calves. No, they're looking. They're talking about the personality as well. So, yeah. So you know, Lewis Ferrin. He's kind of a hero. So I'd be careful. He saved the world. Okay. Twice. Well, he kind of saved the world. Hey, I because th- he decided anyway that he How was going to... How did gonna... he kind of save the world? He saved the world. He kind of saved the world, but he, he kind saved of... the world. Okay, so let's talk about what happened next then. Yeah, so hold he... on. Before we get on to that, I just want to ask you one question. Did the Dark One escape his prison, yes or no? No. He saved the world then. Yes, now let's move on. Okay, now let's move on. <laughs> so, did he save the world? So, yes. Luz Theron decides that the women are too busy arguing about the Siren Grail. There's a lot of problems with the Siren Grail. The shadows attacked areas where they're being made. They can't access them. They can't follow through with their plan. They're trying to get them back. And Luz Theron is like, you know what? I'm done hanging around. I'm done waiting. And he takes the 100 companions... Uh, which are actually 113. There are 113 of the most powerful male channelers of the land. He goes up to Cheryl Ghoul and he's like, we're going to, you know, place these uh, seals, these uh, Quaindea discs over... Say that again, what disc? Quaindea. 
Queen Bear. Yes, that's how oh. it's pronounced in the back of the book. <laughs> Do not pronounce it like that at all. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's supposed to sound like kind of Spanish, isn't it? Like Queen Bear. Okay, yeah, I'm like miles off with this one. Okay, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> okay. So he like puts, they place them, they place them well. They're successful in what they've done. That's fair enough. So there's seven seals, right? Yes. However, there's a counterstroke. And that counterstroke is that when they pulled Sadin into these focal points, the Dark One was able to reach out, touch, physically touch the power. And give it a little tickle. tickle, tickle. And give it a little tickle, <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> fucked it up for everyone. Basically, he tainted it. And it was like a nuclear blast right there on the scene Every single guy who was channeling, who had his power inserted (laughs) into (laughs) the little glory holes, (laughs) were immediately driven to, like, bam. Like, it wasn't gradual at all. It's kind of like, you know, the way you're describing it is you've got these seven guys who are channeling the power into this disc. And they're, like, concentrating, firing as much of the one power into it. And then... From behind, somebody goes, so, what's going on here? And it's, oh, shit! <laughs> <laughs> and there you go. And it's like, because of that, like, you know, he scares them all and puts it and taint. <laughs> <laughs> like, imagine that, you concentrate really hard and, you know, the dark, he doesn't have, he's not a solid form, right? No. He just turns up and just in your ear, you, hear, you can hear shit. Him just saying, so, what's going on here? <laughs> it's like... Nice calves. <laughs> this is what happened. It was tainted. They were on the spot, insane. And okay, you dealt with the dark one. The dark one is no mo. He's locked away. He's... He can't. He can't come to Earth. Yes, planet Earth is safe. But they've unleashed a whole new problem, and that problem is that every single male channeler from here on out. Who touches the source is going to go insane. That shit. I get that, right? What's the bigger problem? Male Chandler's going insane or the Dark One being released? It's fair to say that if the Dark One's released, the wheel breaks and that's it. There's that's there's it. no coming back from it. Nope. So the world was broken anyway. There were it there was an apocalyptic event. The males went crazy, yeah. the earth heaved. Lots and lots and lots of people died. Civilizations were completely destroyed. Everything was scattered. Knowledge was lost. Utopia was no more. Science was done. We were back to zero, pretty much, at this back stage. Back to horse and carriage. We were back to creating fire. Um, cave paintings on the walls. Amen. With that, that's the level that uh, of backwards <clears throat> that we went. It was pure apocalyptic shit. But the will isn't broken, so yeah. the will so can keep. What turning. would you have? What would you have? Would you have the will broken and the dark one released, or would you have a few thousand years of Earth being? blown up and stuff well you'd you'd like to think that preserve as much as you can and start again there you go i've had this discussion in the reading rooms at weaves of the will and for me at that point there should be a parade there should be fireworks there should be ticker tape there should be those people in the band just raising their legs up high and doing the trumpet when these a hundred companions come home to say you lot did it you lot are awesome like there should be a week long holiday to celebrate the fact that Lewis Ferrin single handedly defeated the shadow while the women were too busy discussing about some crazy siren grill but there was there was there was a whole big homecoming and they killed them all Ren they killed them all (laughs) okay that happened Ren that happened but they were all killed they were blowing their trumpets and the trumpets were shoved somewhere uncomfortable and the land was reared and everyone was completely well, fucked how, and how decimated do know, how do they know it wasn't a trick by one of the forsaken right so because the, the forsaken were also trapped at shale ghoul because just by some sheer luck and coincidence when Luz theron traveled there with the hundred companions the forsaken were there for a shadow conference it was so yeah it was a monthly meeting it was their meeting and they were all there so by chance they were they, all sealed the shadow was completely eradicated so that what day they had to but do... that whole new problem was unleashed yeah but that day like i know you're saying 
quite conveniently they were located there. That was actually some slick detective work from Lewis Ferrand because he knew that it was the quarter cycle. So it's the quarterly sales review. Yes. Like what's coming up? What do we need to talk about? And everybody's there just like... Dark Friend of the Month Award. Dark Friend of the Month Award. You're there and it's like, right, what shadow stuff have you done today? And as Modian steps up and he's like, well, I created this tune. (laughs) (laughs) Asmodian is not supposed to be here today. We all know Asmodian's not supposed to be here today. He was just somehow ended up poor Asmodian what a guy I love you know that guy. I think Asmodian is like you know you have to take your younger sibling with you it's like mom I'm going out to play and your mom shouts out take the younger one with you as yeah. well I think it was one of those situations yeah. where you know you don't want to take him but he's there my mom said I had to bring him yeah <laughs> <laughs> I've thrown you way off now you have no idea I have no idea where I am anymore yeah yeah okay so yes they have succeeded in sealing away the Dark One, for, for a time at least. 3,000 years is pretty decent. It's just, I mean, yeah, it's to the Dark One, it's nothing. But, you know, to humanity, it's they're pretty thankful for that. But there is a whole new problem. The world is destroyed. Everyone is fucked. It's... Back, everyone. Well, pretty much everyone. And we had to start again. And although the shadow was eradicated, um, for the most part, they did leave behind some nice treats with uh, Trollocs and Ooh, yeah. Mergels. Yeah. Lots and lots of war followed from this event. So in every opportunity, they were trying to rebuild. Okay. But that didn't happen. But coming back around to Dragon Mount, yeah. let's, let's take a second to think about how was Dragon Mount formed? I mean, we know what happened with Luce Theron. We understand yeah. that. We know he's drawn on a lot of magic. It's a flashing bright light from the heavens. Yeah. We now have some knowledge of weaves and powers and talents. I mean, this is one of the benefits of being at Weaves of the Will is that we had to find out all of these to make sure that our players yeah, could true. do them. So let's speculate. What weaves were used to form Dragon Mount? Nuclear. Has to be nuclear. I mean, come on, look at the explosion. And it's like a bright light, a mushroom cloud, or I'm just speculating on the mushroom cloud, but mushroom cloud <laughs> and everything has to be it's nuclear. like weapons of mass destruction. Mm, I think I think we kind of theorised that possibly one of the weaves that might have been used was spinning earth fire, which is basically a weave of, of like total destruction that is used to form lava, and obviously lava forms rock. Molten from, rock, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it could actually be like a Death Star beam. You know, like when the Death Star fires that beam into Alderaan and completely <laughs> destroys it. I'm glad yeah. you're taking this conversation really seriously. Hey, I'm just I, I'm just explaining it how I understand it. Or it could be like Goku and his Kamehameha wave, you know, like yeah. he's like, Kamehameha. Oh, because they were saying that Lewis was screaming at the point, so you could actually be in screaming could, Kamehameha. Yeah, okay. I mean, I'm going to disagree with you and say maybe it's more likely a spirit bomb. But... Whoa! <laughs> spirit bomb? Hey, Sadai, who taught you spirit bomb? <laughs> I didn't know you knew girl like Dragon Ball trivia I, I know some dragon ball trivia maybe. damn okay <laughs> this podcast might be changing in the future to become a dragon ball podcast from dragon mount to dragon from ball. dragon <laughs> mount to dragon ball z <laughs> rename the show just rename. rename yeah that's it all right stop show's over <laughs> Let's, let's rewind and take it back to a okay. bit of, just a little bit more serious. Yeah, so spinning earth fire was one, and I think we determined that it was possibly earth singing as well. I'm not sure. Like, like Are I you said, familiar with earth singing? No, I'm not a hippie. <laughs> well, earth singing is basically the manipulation of the earth and the ground and being able to lift it and move it around you and basically throw everything around. If he's If he's powerful enough and he's crazy enough, I and think, he's working with that destruction weave. Yeah, I think probably at that point, you know, he's lost all control, right? You know, he's bringing in more power than he can contain. Oh, he's not trying to survive this. Is yeah, he? and he's just, uh, I think he's just spinning for the sake of spinning. And um, yeah. it could be anything. It could be, you know, he probably doesn't even realize what he's actually doing. I think we can confidently say it's not Balefire, though. Yeah, because if it was Balefire, he would be erased from the pattern. Certain things at least would have, even if it didn't hit him. I mean, I know they kind of describe it as that like hot white light beam, which is very similar to Balefire, yeah. Being dis- in description. And obviously they say the Flame of Tarvalon is, is quite similar to, well, it's the reverse of, of Balefire. Yeah. But there's no mention of uh, crystals being formed in Dragon Mountain. And there's, there's never any reference to there being 
crystal mines. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so I'm assuming that it's not those ones. I, I I always kind of felt that the earth fire and the earth singing was. Yeah, was if it, if it was bell fire and the amount of bell fire that you know he's potentially just hit the earth with, he would be eradicated. And I think that would probably mean that his misses and kids and friends who are stuck in the walls with their hands sticking out are probably resurrected at that point, right? <laughs> They could be. They could be. Could yeah. have changed. Eliana! <laughs> or possibly the Dark One's seal was reopened. Or that, yeah. yeah. Could you imagine that? And that would probably be why he didn't weave Balefire. Because he knew the consequences. There was that little bit of sanity there because there of Ishamel's healing. Genius. We figured Gen- it out. There you go. We figured it there out. You go. Yeah. Rafe, what are you saying? <laughs> we got this. Okay, let's move on to the next topic. Yeah. The other thing I noticed, coming away from the histories and how we got to there, there's quite a few spoilers in this prologue. Really? Yeah. Now, if you're a first-time reader, you you won't pick up on them. But if you've read the series before and then you go back and read Dragon Mount, there's quite a few things in there that are very spoilery. But you've already read it, so there oh, are yeah. no spoilers. You're not, so you're not being spoiled. I, I, but I think the word you're looking for is Easter eggs. There's Easter eggs. There's yeah. hints. There's yeah. there's hints. Um, One of the the major ones was uh the, the prophecy that's read at the end of the prologue. Yes. So the prophecy um, says, at the time of need, they will call to the heavens for the champion to be reborn again, and he will make things grow and bring back the lambs. Yeah, Yeah. and let's, let's just read that quickly. And it came to pass in those days, as it had come before and would come again, that the dark lay heavy on the land and weighed down the hearts of men, and the green things failed and hope died. And men cried out to the Creator, saying, O light of the heavens, light of the world, let the promised one be born of the mountain according to the prophecies, as he was in ages past and will be in ages to come. That the prince of the morning sing to the land that green things will grow and the valleys give forth lambs, that the arm of the Lord of the dawn shelter us from the dark, and the great sword of justice defend us. Let the dragon ride again on the winds of time. From Chiral Dinaran T. Calamon, The Cycle of the Dragon, author unknown, The Fourth Age. So there's a couple of clues in there for me. That's very interesting, that. Yeah, Yeah. yeah. there's a couple of clues in there. So he he says about growing, and he says about the lambs. Now, uh, if, if you remember... I think it's in Memory of Light when Rand meets For- Fortuna, Fortuona. I have no way. Damn, I'm realizing just how badly we've been pronouncing everything. But he he meets uh, Tuon and he's in the gardens and he. Oh yeah, he sings, doesn't he? He's singing uh, to the ground and the flowers grow. Do you think that's the Tinker song, or do you think this is completely random? I have no idea. But he's able to do that. He has that ability, and um, it's mentioned right here, right at the start of the books. And then it's mentioned again, right at the end of the books. Um, and I know a lot of people know that Robert Jordan said that he knew how the series would end before yeah. he even started writing um, the beginning part. So he, he made those little hints. He did that deliberately then, didn't he? Yeah. yeah that's, you know, we will never know the answers because mm. the but great the man's ad- not around anymore. But yeah, I see what you're saying there. There's a lot of like Easter eggs and things that you can draw and be like, ah, oh, so that's what this meant. We've got sort of the things about the the lambs. You know, he is a sheep farmer. He's a he's a sheep herder. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Perrin. Did and... you say sheep farmer? Sorry, you meant shepherd, right? <laughs> sheep farmer. <laughs> a sheep herder. Yeah. yeah. Well, he he is, and you know, in the beginning part, you have the question of out of the three boys, who is the dragon reborn? Is it Rand? Yeah. Is it Matt? Or is it Perrin? Now, Perrin's a blacksmith. Um, his Matt's daddy's rich because you know he rears horses. Do you reckon they're wealthy? I think they're the most. I think they are pretty wealthy because um, he says that his dad breeds horses. Matt knows the price of a good horse, and horses are considered pretty expensive in True. in the West. His dad's a breeder, isn't he? Yes. Yeah. Um, and his dad has cows as well. His dad's not the sheep farmer. He's the cow farmer and the horse breeder. Matt also gets away with a lot of things which might make sense if he's part of a wealthier family 
in a yeah, small village. That's the whole mentality. Like I could pretty much do what I want because I'm spoiled. <laughs> yeah, and he enjoys the finer things because maybe he's that's used to true. them. That's true. That's true. Throughout the whole series, he's like, I want to be in a nice inn. I want to drink the best wine. I want to wear the best clothes. I so want that could, the nicest ankles. <laughs> I, want the, I want the ankles that are the finest yeah. <laughs> in the land. So that's actually a very good point there, yeah. Swana. You, you, yeah, I, I can concur. So you got Perrin, who's the blacksmith. Um, so you know he's not gonna be leading any sheep. Mm-hmm. And then you've got Matt, who likes horses. Mm-hmm. So that only leaves one person to be the dragon reborn. The sheep herder himself. The sheep herder himself. Yeah, the maybe. The tabak farmer. That might be the clue right there. Him being the sheep herder. And they make a point of saying, you know, they constantly call him the sheep herder, sheep yeah. herder, sheep herder. Um, before we know which one of the three boys is, is the dragon reborn. I mean, yeah. we get a pretty big clue that it's going to be Rand anyway. He's the first character after the prologue that we actually meet. Yeah, point of view. His point of view is the main one throughout the And don't series. forget um, when they're running from the Trollocs in Eye of the World and they get taken to that inn. But that's the first time that you know for sure that it, it has to be him. Right, up until then it's like... Who is it? Who is it? Is it Matt? Is it Perry? No. You, you know, originally, you'd think it's the guy with the badger, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's the badger think. reborn. The badger <laughs> reborn. And that's pretty much it for this week. It's been a pleasure. But before we go, mm-hmm. let's just talk about what's been happening in the Wheels of the Wheel this week. Uh, I understand the White Tower has a new Ace of Die and a novice. Yes, uh, we raise Karina to the White Jar. So, congratulations to Karina Sadai. Congratulations. And uh, yeah, we've got a brand new novice, uh, Zarel. Uh, she's just joined us, and we're already guessing yeah. what her Arjar is going to be. And um, we're really excited to have you at Weaves of the Wheel. Yeah. So, welcome to Weaves of the Wheel. Yeah. And if anyone is interested in joining the Weaves of the Wheel uh, community, it's a social platform. You can become an Aes Sedai, an Ashaman, a Warder, a Dark Friend, a member of the Band of the Red Hand. Uh, there's so many different playing options for you. And it's really simple and easy to get involved. Just uh, drop us a message at Weaves of the Wheel on Instagram. Our next episode, we will be um, tackling Winter's Night. I went to say Winter's Night and I was like, no, not again, please. I can't do it again. I just can't. It's an empty road. We're going to, yeah, so we're going to do uh, the couple of chapters that lead us up to uh, Winter's Night, the events of Winter's Night. Yeah, so we'll be reading the first five chapters of The Eye of the World and we'll be doing a summary of those chapters. So up to the events of Winter's Night, that's the first yeah. major event for us. Okay, so we're going to be doing that on the, um, listening to the audiobooks and that will be the next podcast that will be the next podcast so until the well of time turns may the light be with you <laughs>